Hello and welcome to video number nine. Today we'll talk about gray box identification. All right, so what does that mean? Uh, before we have estimated uh, linear models uh, without any particular structure in them. So we have just said, find us some matrices uh, A, B, C, and D that, that fits my data. And uh, given that form of the model, uh, the, the estimation algorithm has been completely free to choose whatever A uh, and B and so uh, that it wants. Uh, but very often we know some particular structure of our uh, system equations, uh, but maybe we just have some unknown parameters. So maybe we want to do parameter calibration or parameter fitting, something like that. And maybe our system is in fact not linear. So this is a linear state space system, but we can also have non-linear state space systems. And then maybe we can write them on this form. So here we have a generic function f. So the derivative of the state is given by a function of the state, the current state and the input. And maybe there is some additive noise here, w. Uh, here I showed it uh, the noise to be additive. It doesn't have to be additive. It can be uh, we can include the noise as an argument to this function also if we would like. And then maybe our output uh, y here is also a nonlinear function of the state and the input, and and that maybe has an another additive uh, measurement noise here. So if we now include some some uh, unknown parameters here, uh, we can make that explicit. Uh, so we say that the, the function here, the dynamics, doesn't depend on only state and input, but also some parameter vector. All right. So say that we would like to estimate these parameters um, for this nonlinear or linear uh, system. So f, f can, of course, still be linear if we want to. Uh, how, how would we uh, do that? So before we have talked a lot about uh, predictors. So for a linear system, uh, a predictor might look something like this. So here we have a linear correction um, where we compute the residual and, and use that to, to correct the state. So for linear systems, if, if the noise terms here are Gaussian, then the comma filter is optimal for a linear system. But for a nonlinear system, it's a bit more tricky. We can, uh, if, if we have uh, if we still assume that the noise terms are Gaussian, then maybe we can use some nonlinear variant of a Kalman filter, so extended Kalman filter or uncentered Kalman filter. If they are not Gaussian or if they don't enter additively, then maybe we use a particle filter or a moving horizon estimator or something like that. We can, of course, also just use the model itself. Um, so the model itself is kind of a primitive predictor. It, it doesn't make use of measurements, so it's, it's just a simulation model, but you can call that the predictor if you want, right? It's the most basic predictor. Uh, that basic predictor has some problems. Uh, if, if this term uh, W is large, uh, then, uh, then we benefit a lot from making use of measurements uh, to guide the evolution of the system. And um, if this system is unstable, then if we try to simulate that without any guidance from the measurement, the simulation will always diverge. So then it becomes very difficult to estimate if we just use the model as a predictor, but that's possible in some cases. Uh, all right, but here we will actually make use of an approach where we use an uncentered comma filter for a, for a nonlinear system. So we will, the uncentered comma filter will take in information about the covariance of W and E and figure out an optimal uh, correction uh, or an approximation to the optimal correction of the state. All right, so the system we will consider today uh, is nonlinear. It's a quadruple tank process. So we have two upper tanks uh, with some liquid in it and they uh, feed into two lower tanks. And all of these tanks are fed by two pumps and there is some cross term. So uh, each pump here feeds into more than one tank. All right. So the equations for this system is uh, here. We have four state variables. It's the level of each tank, so height one to four. And we see that this is nonlinear because uh, we have the height of the tank appearing in the denominator here and under a square root. So this is Torricelli's law that says that the flow out of a tank is proportional to the square root of the height of the level. All right, and the input enters uh, linearly, and there is some 
terms here, uh, gamma and k, that determine the gain. And we would like to estimate those uh, parameters, k and uh, gamma. And we would also like to estimate the, the uh, cross-sectional area of the tank. So we have four such cross-sectional areas. All right. Here we have um, the dynamics on continuous time form. So this is just a function that computes these uh, equations. So we take in the state, the input parameters, and also time. That's the convention. And then we say that the parameters k1 and k2 are given by the first and second elements of the parameter vector. Gravitational constant, this uh, seem to be known. And all the areas are equal, and they are given by the third parameter. And then we have um, these gamma cross, uh, cross gain terms are given by the fourth parameter. And then we just have a special version of the square root that uh, square root is not defined for negative numbers, but if we simulate this, we might get a very tiny negative number. So this is kind of a numerically robust way of handling that. Uh, the measurement we have access to is the level in tank number one and two. So we can't observe the, the levels in tank uh, three and four. And this uh, measurement function encodes that. So this is the function that was called g up here in the equations here. It's this function. All right. And then since this is in continuous time, this is a function that says uh, that returns the derivative of the state given the current state and input. Uh, to simulate that, we need a discrete time version of the function. And there is a package, C2D. So that's uh, just a, a funny way of, uh, of uh, spelling this function from the control system package that takes the continuous time uh, system and discretizes it. So this does that, but for nonlinear systems. And we will discretize using the runge kutta 4 method with a sample time of uh, one second. And internally, it will take two steps. All right. Uh, to do this nonlinear gray box identification, we also need to specify the dimension of the state and the dimension of the output and the dimension of the input. Okay, so we have two measurement signals, two inputs, and a four dimensional state. All right, so here we have some identification data. We have, uh, so I've, I've simulated this, it's uh, hidden from you right now. Uh, but this is what you would read from a CSV file or something if you do this in practice. Uh, we have a thousand data points roughly and uh, yeah, two inputs, two outputs. All right, so to perform this estimation, we need to provide, uh, first of all, an initial guess for the initial conditions. This is the state uh, in the beginning of the experiment. And here I just provided some guess uh, based on looking at the plot. So providing the guess for uh, the two states that uh, state variables that are measured is quite easy because we can just look in the plot. But an initial guess for the state variables that we cannot measure, it's uh, much harder. So here I just picked an arbitrary initial guess. And we of course also need an initial guess for the parameters since this is an iterative gradient based estimation. So here I picked some values. And uh, then uh, the prediction error method also, uh, the, this particular implementation of it requires us to provide the covariance matrices of the noises, W and E. All right, so here I just provide something. I say that the covariance matrix for the dynamics noise is uh, diagonal. Um, and I just picked a number here and then the measurement noise covariance is also diagonal. So the measurement noise covariance is easy to measure. You can just uh, gather some so measurement data and look at the variance properties. Uh, this is uh, much harder uh, to estimate, uh, but uh, if you're curious uh, how we can figure out a good uh, value for this parameter, uh, I will link to a blog post uh, later in the YouTube video description that you can read. All right, so here we have some data and we show uh, the data in red. We see it's a bit noisy. This is the measurement. Here is the input. We see the input is kind of a square chirp that increases a bit in frequency and here we show a simulation with the initial parameters so the parameters of our initial guess and we see that it's a bit off but it has the in general the overall correct shape all right so how do we now uh, estimate a model it's fairly simple 
uh, we call the function nonlinear prediction R method in control system identification. We pass the data and here we pass the discrete time dynamics. So this is the function quad tank that we had passed into the uh, Rungen Kutta 4 integrator and we uh, got back a, a something called discrete dynamics. The measurement function, our initial guess for parameters and for the initial condition, the covariance matrices, and we also need to say uh, the dimension of the input. The dimension of the output and the, the dimension of the state can be inferred from the size of these two matrices. So that's why we only have to provide the dimension of the input. Okay, so this <coughs> internally performs an optimization problem. It uh, requires five iterations. It took 120 milliseconds. So even though this is a nonlinear, uh, non-convex optimization problem, it's still fairly quick. We have a thousand data points here, so it's not, uh, it's not too bad. Um, and we can see now, now we can plot the simulation where we use the optimized parameters and we compare that to the uh, simulation with the initial guess parameters. And now we see that with the optimized parameters, we are kind of in the middle of the noisy data here. So that looks uh, very good. And here I just call the function simplot. All right, so we can try. Here we had some initial guess, all right? What if we use another initial guess? What if we use just 10% of the initial guess? We see that, okay, now it took a few more iterations. It took nine iterations, so... Uh, 200 milliseconds, but it still converged to, to the true, or kind of a, a, it converged to a, a model that has a good simulation performance. Okay, what if we have a really terrible initial guess? So now we have our initial guess is almost zero. Right, so now we took 11 iterations and we see that now the model doesn't actually fit all that well. All right, but, but what's the problem here? Okay, so here we plot the simulation um, performance, but we have optimized a predictor. All right, so we can plot the prediction performance also. And if we do that, we see that the prediction performance is very good. It's kind of uh, in the middle of the data here, just like it was before. Uh, so this is an indication that the prediction error method will try to find you a good predictor, and that might not necessarily be a good simulator. All right, so that's worth uh, keeping in mind. But in this case, if we use uh, not a completely terrible initial condition, we actually get a good simulator also. All right. So before we are happy, we do some residual autocorrelation analysis. And here we look at the, yeah, the autocorrelation of the residual and we see that it's mostly zero. It's within the confidence uh, bands. And we look at the cross correlation between the input and the, the residual. And here we see a lot of different colors. And that's because we have two inputs and two outputs. So there are four pairs of uh, input output, uh, four input output pairs. And they are all kind of small. We have the confidence bands up here. So that looks good. All right. And to conclude, since this was a simulated example, we actually have access to the true parameters. So, um, those parameters that I use to generate the data. Uh, they are given in the first column in this matrix here. Our initial guess was the second column and then our optimized parameters is the third column. So we see that optimized parameters have become quite uh, close to the true parameters here. So in general, for nonlinear systems, uh, you are not always guaranteed that you actually can identify all the parameters uh, from your data. So we have spoken about problem with identifiability and so on before. And for nonlinear uh, systems, that becomes a bit more complicated. So in this case, it, it looks like we actually recover the true parameters. Uh, but if we don't have access to what the true parameters are, uh, this analysis can of course not be done. And then there are some tools for you in the Julia ecosystem that can allow you to analyze a model already before you have any data to try to figure out if I have good data from this uh, system, can I identify the parameters or not? And uh, for some models, you actually cannot, and then you maybe have to reconsider. All right, so here in the end, I just generate the identification data, so it's just simulate the system. All right, so to summarize, uh, we have identified a model of uh, this particular quadruple tank system. It's nonlinear. We have identified some of the parameters, and we use that by 
encoding the dynamics of the system as two functions, f and g. And then we used an uncentered Kalman filter. Uh, we didn't explicitly construct that uncentered Kalman filter, but we provided the covariance matrices uh, for w and e, and underneath the hood an optimization problem was solved to, to optimize these parameters. All right, and that concludes this video. Thank you.